Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled 1001 Windmills of the Mind. A collection of advanced self-help quotes taken from what's often called the psychodynamic or the psychoanalytic perspective, which long ago, as I understand it, was referred to by some as philosophical medicine or narrative medicine, helping one to find their narrative truth, their story, and the story of their parents. If we can get our parents' story, why they did what they did, that helps us to know ourselves. Things make sense. We have a self-concept. Then with that self-concept, uh, we now have a floor, so to speak, for sadness to appear. And then we can admit the loss, the truth, the painful truth. Uh, if we can do that, um, that consolidates our sense of self, it validates our sense of self. And then, um, you know, then we can uh, see, enjoy the present more rather than being frozen in the past in denial of what happened and then kind of stuck like that going through the motions of life uh, so that's a that's sort of a one uh, that's sort of a major theme uh, throughout our series here uh, it's a topic called repetition compulsion so we have a uh, 10,000 uh, quotes in our collection um, 10,000 uh, 10, quotes uh, like this uh, sometimes they're longer like that one uh, sometimes uh, yeah, so yesterday they were kind of shorter like that one. So they range between shorter ones and longer ones kind of thing. Uh, they're clear, easy to understand, educational, fun, fun to read, educational, enlightening. Um, you know, I don't, I, I'm not a philosopher, I don't have a PhD, I'm not interested in obscure, you know, uh, you know, splitting hairs over what something might mean or should mean or could mean or something that really is being used. Um, as a defense mechanism. A lot of this intellectualization and philosophizing actually is being used to get away from feelings. It's actually possible to use theories and ideas and constructs and being in our head all the time to get away from our feelings. So this is the opposite. Uh, we want to use insights to build a catchment to catch our feelings, to get back our feelings. We had our golden ball, our pure feelings, or we lost it, we want to get it back. That's the basic common monomyth uh, you know, uh, at midlife, that the realization that in childhood, with trauma, we lose our feeling self, our sense of self, our ontological self, sort of our innocence and authentic. This can be symbolized with Snow White in the box, in the glass box. Okay, that that's a metaphor that our authentic, pure, authentic kind of thing, a young like that. So it it didn't, it's not alive anymore. It's there. It's not totally gone, but it's Snow White was in a deep sleep, so a coma or something, and she was in the glass box, kind of like. We're detached from ourselves, plus we're not connected to ourselves. There's like that glass wall there kind of thing. We sense it, we have a glass wall, we can't feel it kind of thing. So that's the issue. Um, in childhood trauma, Snow White gets put into a glass box. Now this, this, uh, this is just one variation of a common motif, of a main motif, where our authentic self gets frozen, uh, turned to stone, petrifies, becomes wooden, uh, it becomes like a, like a regressed, it could be like a thing now, like a stuffed animal, it could become even regressed, like like a, like a an animal or something, it could, like, it, that's just a metaphor that we don't have access uh, to our authentic self, but I like, like the Snow White one, that's probably the most popular one, right? Um, actually, in Myths and Fairy Tales, the most popular representation of it, of when our authentic self is um, unavailable to us is when a character which represents our authentic self, symbolizes our authentic self, turns to stone, becomes a statue. Echo becomes a statue. Faithful John in the Grimm's Tale, the Faithful John story that Robert Wiley likes to tell. Faithful John, a metaphor for a person's embodiment, their authentic self. Faithful John became a statue. So in Miss and Fairy Tales, when a character, uh, be okay, mean, uh, specifically when that character is a metaphor for a person's uh, embodiment, true self, authentic self, like that. Uh, you know, the Snow White image, you, you could vary, it can be a variation. You could say Snow White turns to a statue, or she's in a, it's the same thing. The, 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 the basic psychological message is the same. Our authentic self is in cold storage, down a tunnel, far away from us, we're disconnected from it. So the, the jargon is athemoalexia. Since our feelings related to our authentic self, our authentic, our pure feelings is related to our authentic self. So they're both. The gold of ball goes down the wall at the same time. I feel they're for amnes. So the amnes and the feelings, uh, the pure feelings are like that. So if um, I'm speaking a, a little loudly because I'm, I'm, yeah, a little, uh, a little, uh, just um, 
a little, I had a change of routine here today. I thought I was gonna go to another venue where I didn't need to bring my ice and, you know, to cool off and all this. I went there, oh my God, I can't do it there. So I hopped back on a sky train, came back to my, you know, favorite spot here. So I didn't bring my usual kind of supplies. So I, I need, I, I'm really heavily dependent on the fan today. Usually I bring like some ice and all that. Um, so that's, sorry about the extra noise here today. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't do this video without the fan. So the give back, if the audio is too annoying or my, or my anxious delivery is, uh, you know, whatever, not appealing, whatever, you know, then just click the war link, see the quotes there. And that's the case for every video. I haven't been analyzed. I haven't been analyzed. I have anxiety. You know, I haven't been analyzed. So keep that in mind. I only have a BA. I'm the compiler of the quotes. So I'm just finding the quotes, sharing them kind of thing. But I'm excited nonetheless because they're clear. I'm learning. Uh, you know, you, you get a lot of aha moments. You, you can change things a little bit. Uh, you, don't need to, you don't need to blindly keep repeating something that's dysfunctional. When you get the story of it, oh my God, I don't, really, I don't need to do that kind of thing. Yeah, it, it, it's a relief. Yeah, these quotes can offer an, a relief. And my hope is that one out of 10 will offer some little relief. And you do that every day. Okay, we have a thousand videos here. So uh, on average, there are 10 quotes per video. So there are 10,000 quotes here. And then uh, Robert Bly says, read psychology every day for 10 minutes. So that's pretty much the case with each video. You read, you read, you read the quotes for each video, pluck out one quote, assuming you find one that you like. Maybe none, maybe the next video you might find two, kind of thing. Just on average. Uh, one can customize, personalize, have their own unique for them, customized for them, tailored for them. You tailor it for yourself. Your own personal 1001 windmills of the mind. It, it, your own catches me. And that, that's, uh, that's encouraging because now that's not the complete story, but that sets up the healing. That sets the stage for healing. Uh, just like the catcher behind home plate in Major League Baseball, you know, he's going to be able to catch that speed ball coming barreling down at 100 miles an hour because he's got the mitt. So you got to first get the mitt, then, then he'll catch the ball. Uh, it's a variation of what a famous one poet said. Psychoanalysis looks for an egg. Psychoanalysis. Okay, so psychosynthesis leads to psychoanalysis. Uh, like you want a healing and wholeness. Our authentic self is away from us. So it's like a gap like that. We want to get it back. That's wholeness and healing. So psychoanalysis leads to psychosynthesis. Um, so psychoanalysis uh, leads, um, look, looks for an egg in a basket that's missing. So first weave this basket. That's what this is about. Just weave the basket. It's, it's, yes, it's all cognitive insights. And you never know, uh, just spontaneously an emotional knowing may come about. Uh, so the basket is the cognitive insights. You know, leave it alone like that. Leave the nest alone like that. And maybe spontaneously, you don't control that, but maybe spontaneously an egg will appear. And in the egg is a beautiful bird. And when the bird flies up, uh, that's the metaphor is emotional knowing. Emotional knowing when the bird flies up. Uh, in one story, the protagonist hops in the back of the firebird and rides the firebird up. That's a metaphor for getting back our vitality, our feelings, and the vibrancy of the, of the, the colorful um, feathers of the firebird and all this. So yeah, so there's, there's two parts to the authentic self. So once again, the word of the year by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary Company for uh, 2023 last year was authentic. We're all born with this authentic self. It's, we're all born with it. It's unique for everybody, but it's not fully blossomed. It needs mother's love for that to take place. Okay, so it's unique for everybody. But, but we have it. Babies need an, an, a secure attachment style with, with the mother, like a, what they call a secure. I got that. Yeah, this is going to happen on me. As the earth um, rotates on its axis, um, uh, the buildings uh, beside me are going to, and the trees and branches are going to uh, block uh, the light uh, accordingly as it turns over the sun kind of thing. So um, I need to make an adjustment already. Jeez, I'm still, you know, believe it or not, I'm still sweating. Even with the fan blaring right behind me, I, I can still feel the sweat coming. It's, it's, it's bakey. You don't see it, but it's in the high 30s. And the heat index is like in the mid 40s here. So um, everybody's indoor. All the guests are indoors. No one's outside. I mean, not even a single. Last time I was here, there were a few people who bared it outside. So that's one of the odd, one of the strange benefits of this venue. Um, nobody else. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, I think I can um, maybe move the chair up a bit because uh, get, I'm, getting, I'm getting a light issue here. Oh, uh, it's okay now? Is it okay? Yeah, if I just wait a few minutes, it might be okay, yeah. I gotta keep an eye on this. Oh, jeez, let's see this again. Is it draining on me? It's happening again. Son of a gun, it's doing it again. Okay, jeez, I don't know what's going on here. I reset the phone, it still didn't work. Son of a gun. I, I've been having real tech issues lately. So if for some reason my phone's not drawing on this extra battery pack, it's only going to use the built-in battery, which only has barely an hour in it. And then uh, when it drains, uh, it'll reboot, and then I might get another hour, and then it'll do it again. And then the third time around, it suddenly it accepts it for some strange reason. So this will be done at least in two parts by the looks of it. Uh, so I got to keep an eye. You know, I have to, uh, if, if at any time the camera just shuts out, uh, quickly and I didn't catch it I lose the whole thing I got a pop-up window it gives me barely like two seconds uh, and I got to hit the thing before uh, to, in order to capture the, the video uh, that's why the last video was done in six parts I had this issue it took me two days and six parts to get through it uh, I was a good good uh, good discussion I, you know 2805 was I thought maybe one of the better presentations on my end I felt refreshed uh, I felt um, uh, nice weather conditions and all this uh, that was uh, not bad, I thought. Um, and this video will be doing a uh, 06. Um, kind of a little bit on the self-help end. Once in a while we post, just take a break, post some self-help quotes. Uh, so this will be mostly from the self-help material. But 90% of what we're posting here is from the shrinks. Uh, when I say shrinks, I mean medical doctors, actual, genuine medical doctors who got tired of playing whack-a-mole with people's psychosomatic symptoms and then went to the shrink school, the, I mean the talking cure school, uh, and then decided to, well, let's, what about narrative medicine? Does that work? That's kind of humanistic. We validate the person's emotions. Maybe it doesn't need to go into the symptom. See, when we reject the emotions, it turns in on it. It, it turns inward and it goes to the organs. And there's a problem with the organ failure. Capex has the clearest uh, uh, quote on this. The baby is crying, let's say, or screaming at the mother. It's relational. The baby's reaching out to the mother. Mother, you didn't meet my needs. I feel scared here. Now I'm angry. You, you, you did something wrong here. I'm angry. So whatever it is, the child's relating to the mother. His emotions, his distress is relating to the mother. Now what if the mother doesn't get it, uh, is frustrated by it, annoyed by it, and uh, maybe punishes the child for, for bothering her or something? Who knows? Oh, cunning tail. We don't know what kind of maybe bad mood she might, might be in that moment. If that's the case, then what happens is the child's life force, which was relational to the mother, it kind of turns inward now and now there's a pathological investment into the organs and that's it overwhelms it now there'll be a psychosomatic symptom with any organ organ system anywhere skin uh, liver what you know any any wherever back pain shoulder pain uh, it does it, any any place um, now now the baby's cries and screams are rerouted through the body and now it's crying and screaming through the body so now the person goes to the doctor, oh doctor, I got a symptom here. And he plays whack-a-mole with the symptoms, the way the mother played whack-a-mole with his feelings. Oh, hold on a sec. Try not to get people in the camera, but hold on. Oh, hold on a sec. Sometimes people are curious, what's he talking about? Let's um, wait a minute here. Or let me, uh, maybe I can briefly move, move over, hold on a sec. all over. Yeah, a little awkward as a guy just uh, standing right behind me and wanting to... Well, he's smoking, right? So yeah, Janoff says that uh, when, when a person reaches for a cigarette, do they know? Do they know that they're in pain? And it's the pain that's making him reach for the cigarette? And they're using the cigarette as a tranquilizer? 
like a cigarette is uh, Janov calls cigarettes tranquilizers you know just like uh, Roger Gould calls cookies um, over-the-counter uh, tranquilizers um, because it puts you in a food trance the sugar salt and fat trick tricks your brain to send you uh, serotonin which is the feeling that you feel safe so you get this kind of blissful feeling I feel safe um, plus you have the fantasy that the food is a, is a symbol of mother um, so you got that kind of hope like that and then you, then your brain releases serotonin not by the reality that you're safe with the mother back in the past but the mammalian part of the brain perceives the, con the concentrated sugar salt and fat as the person being safe by the extra plus food and from that level of safety from the food end the brain releases serotonin now if the babies love to get serotonin from the safety of the mother but the person didn't get that safety of the mother so he always looks for tricks some, you know, little tricks like that so when, when you reach for the trick uh, for a minute there you might feel oh um, am I back am I in a one in a minus safe blissful period of oneness with my mother in this trans happy kind of place like that um, so he calls it like that and um, you know cigarettes maybe I have it uh, do the same thing in a, in a different roundabout way um, so um, you know uh, we don't have a threat on smoking but um, you know if a baby's sucking his thumb that's abuse he's being abused the mother's neglecting him hurting him okay, he's moving on good okay let's go back I need the fan yeah and, you know um, if the baby can't find a nipple right and he's desperate uh, He'll turn to his thumb for his mother, mother's nipple. Mother doesn't care. You gotta be kidding. That, that's that's really a form of child abuse. If the child has to resort to his own thumb to stand in for his mother's nipple, come on, come on. And that that kid is being abused like that. Uh, so uh, then he grows up. A uh, child in that condition grows up. Uh, they may continue that uh, fantasy link to the mother. So the cigarette uh, maybe resembles the nipple. The th sorry, the cigarette can remind the person of the thumb, which which is a substitute for the missing nipple. So there's that momentary regression or a triggering of what you need, because you needed that safe feeding experience. So for a little while. Um, okay, that's sort of undeveloped. I don't really have a full developed thread on smoking. Um, but uh, check out the Janov quote uh, where he talks about smoking as a, a five minute tranquilizer. Like, oh yeah, the point was if the mother's pregnant, if the mother's pregnant. Oh, this is kind of awkward here today. Yeah, this is really kind of awkward here today. That whole end in the back is all occupied. I've only got this little corner here. I'm wondering if I should try another venue, to tell you the truth. Yeah, let's do that. Let, let's go. Let me hit the pause button. Let me continue in another venue. Because I think I don't feel uh, kind of relaxed here today for some reason. Yeah, I had a little drama uh, this morning going to the other place, being disappointed and coming here. And uh, you know, not having my... Uh, uh, like my, my full supplies kind of thing. I'm gonna need to find an air conditioned place because normally when I come outdoors, I bring like an like ice pack kind of thing. It helps me to cool off, but I'm not really cooling off uh, here. Okay, uh, let's, let's do this. Yeah, sorry for the rough beginning here. Um, let me just read the part of the sentence. I'll hit the stop button, the uh, pause button. And when I get to the new venue, I'll release the pause button and complete the sentence. Uh, let's do the first one here by the self-help author Lindsay Gibson. I don't know her. I just was surprised to see her book get thousands of uh, reviews, glowing reviews. I go, you really? Seriously? Let's, let's check this out. It's just the same old stuff, the same old self-help uh, kind of ideas, basic general ideas. But what, made, what, what I think made her popular was her phrase. Instead of calling the mother narcissistic mother, the borderline mother, you know, uh, she calls the parent emotionally immature parent. So anytime she talks about a dysfunctional mother, uh, any or the mother with the bully pattern, or the mother who's malignant or cruel, or any anything, anytime, in any self-help author when they describe the mother in some kind of negative way with some label, she takes the same discussion 
but just plucks out the phrase and puts in the phrase emotionally immature mother and I think you know it's funny I, I, I also felt a little uh, validated by that reading that yeah emotionally immature mother emotionally immature father that that's a little more uh, descriptive um, it has more of a descriptive uh, quality to it instead of saying oh she's the borderline mother or she's uh, the father has the narcissistic personality disorder like these kinds of things so uh, she, she that's I think that's what it is emotionally immature parents uh, fear genuine emotion and pull back from emotional closeness oh you know what she did she just took a general typical self-help book about narcissism codependency and BPD took the same mishmash and just substituted those three for emotionally immature parents that's all she did and she got uh, tens of thousands of reviews and it's not even that accurate it's not even in depth or anything it's just the general fluffy uh, and she needed a lot of help to edit and correct and uh, I don't know what it is it's just it just seems to be the phrase that's appealing but uh, but fine fine let's give her credit she deserves the credit it's um, emotionally immature parents use coping mechanisms that resist reality rather than dealing with it they don't welcome self-reflection emotionally immature parents don't welcome self-reflection so think about your parents would they welcome self-reflection would they welcome any kind of feedback uh, would they would they would the parents go to a, a couple's counselor or they, they might be enraged might be insulted at the idea they don't welcome self-reflection so they rarely apologize uh, so, so yeah and, they, and also they rarely accept blame or well, they're in survival anxiety everything do is based on survival so they did nothing wrong uh, because the mostly immature parents or parents with the BPD pattern those with the sting of personality pattern the Iago pattern bully pattern lower functioning BPD um, yeah uh, okay all those sting of personality patterns that we normally talk about and they're all in survival anxiety so all these care all these person all these uh, all per, uh, persons with a personality pattern that in this collection here we've just out of laziness I've been calling them stinger personality patterns uh, just ballpark right meaning trauma before 18 months they're in survival anxiety that's why so many people won't apologize never regret did nothing wrong they'll blame you for something they did something wrong no you did it wrong like they're in survival anxiety they're in this panic at the nipple back to the back to the nipple so the, uh, when the baby's trying to breastfeed mother's doing it wrong miss a tune mal a tune force feeding not feeding withdrawing prematurely then the rubber nipple comes in baby wants it mother puts honey on the rubber nipple what a battle what a struggle for the baby from the baby's end he's he's an immense survival he's per, he feels persecuted his 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 his, 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 uh, his survival he feels like a survival is kind of at stake here kind of thing he needs a safe reliable feeding experience he doesn't want a mother who uh uh, doesn't understand the signals and all this because the uh, baby doesn't know time and uh, so there's like a, so there's a constant survival anxiety so imagine that as the blueprint the template the prototype the schema the working model the imprint the stencil the etching in the brain and they come from that so they go through life with that etching and that etching says survival survival mother's uh, doing it wrong mother's hurting me mother's uh, uh, not giving me the real thing uh, mother's following some schedule um, I want emotional feeling. She's giving me food when I'm not physically hungry. I, I can't take this. Mother's angry. She's rough handling. You know this whole area. Uh, that's why later on, in, in, if, a pers uh, if a person has attitudes kind of in that area, I do nothing wrong. You're wrong. Uh, they're in survival anxiety because they can't admit any vulnerability because they're they were vulnerable with the mother and the mother hurt them. So later on, they don't admit any vulnerability. They don't trust. They don't feel. They don't. Yeah, that's called alexithymia, uh, fear of feelings. No, no words for feelings. Uh, their immaturity makes them inconsistent and emotionally unreliable, and they're blind to their child, children's needs. Once their own agenda comes into play, that's a key one. There, the parents have trauma from their past. That's all they see: the survival anxiety of the trauma in the past. They don't see the child's needs in the present. They only see the projection of their past needs because that trauma early on is in a state of timelessness. There's no time, so all time is that time. So here's the child, they don't see the child for who they are. They only see the past unmet needs and that struggle they have, so they continue to struggle. So they continue to struggle with their own child. 
first they, sh they shame the child because they because they were shamed, and then they see the child as the mother who hurt them. Now they're fighting with the mother. It's it's crazy. It's psychotic stuff actually. Okay, and here's a little just on a self-help uh, way of saying it. Myths and fairy tales have been depicting such parents for centuries. So from the child's perspective, from the child's perspective, the mother is like one of these myth mythological characters. Think of how many fairy tales feature abandoned children who must find aid from animals and other helpers because their parents are careless, clueless, or absent. In some stories, the parent character is actually malevolent, and the children must take their survival into own hands. Hansel and Gretel, right? Uh, these stories have been popular for centuries because they touch a common core. How children must fend for themselves after their parents have neglected or abandoned them. Abandoned them. Apparently, immature parents have been a problem for a very long time. So we're not blaming the parents, it's just they only see the past. They, they, they don't see the present. Their perceptual apparatus is narrow. They only see the projection of the past because they're mostly in the past. Now, when the parents were traumatized in the past, that's in a state of timelessness. There's no time. All time is that time. So, in the present, it's still the past emotionally. In the present, they're going to continue to struggle with the mother in the past. Either by uh, expecting too much from people in the present, to be the, parent, the good parent that was missing in the past, or they, um, or they flip it. They oh, hold on a sec. Oh, there's a whole group uh, coming in my intro. I want to check out this. Okay, let me. Um, one second. through all right actually not the all what I can do is when the bat oops when the battery runs out on this uh, on this go round I'll do part two at the other venue. Let's see, 74% already. Look at that, 74% already. So this, this will cut out maybe, this will be like, this part one might be like 45 minutes long or something. Yeah, I, I don't feel settled, I don't feel calm today. I feel a little extra anxious here today. Yeah, check out the yesterday's videos. I was, I was in a good space yesterday. I thought those videos weren't bad, the, the, the six-parter. Um, yeah, those were okay. Is the lighting? Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with the lighting. Oh, the lighting here. That's okay, right? No, you're hearing the wind. See, that's another issue. When the, when the fan blows uh, the air, the camera picks, it creates a muffling sound. Let's just take that. Or just start it now. I'm tempted to hit the pause button now. Look at that. Even with the fan, I'm still I'm, I'm sweating while the fan is blowing. I'm, I'm still, Well, the coffee's a part of it, right? Yeah, okay, uh, Jesus, yeah. So that's, that's today's main highlight, the phrase. Emotionally immature parents. Think of it that way. It gets away from, you know, labeling them and demonizing them, and, uh, you know, and um, it, it offers a little empathy when you say that. 
It offers a little reality empathy like that. Because the parents may have been traumatized. And they didn't go through the developmental process. Right? So that's why you want to see them as more than humans. Uh, then you maybe understand why they did what they did. That moves towards your identity. And that's what we have to do. We have to unblend, uh, uh, establish our own distinct identity. Uh, that's not bogged down with trying to save the mother, please the mother, imitate the mother, still afraid to know ourselves because the memory is mother will punish us. So some mothers, you know, they have a baby and they say, and they like that oneness. Like some mothers have a baby and, oh, this is fun. I like this kind of oneness like this. And, but the baby has to hatch out, have his own self, his own thoughts, his own mind, his own individuation process. Some mothers say, oh, no, you don't. If you have your own strivings, you betray me. You with me or against me? Okay, mother, I'll give myself up. I, I won't know myself. I'll, what do you want, mother? I'll just stay like this. So, all oh, good, good. So she rewards the symbiosis for her pleasure and punishes the child's autonomy. That keeps the child trapped in the tarpet of a negative symbiosis. You can imagine how angry the child's going to be. What does he do with his soul? Okay, he puts it into cold storage in a glass box. Okay, um, turns to stone, petrifies, and so on and so on. Oh. Actually, the guests are just starting to leave. Let's see. What is it? Two, two o five. It's funny, I was so refreshed this morning, I was so invi I left quite early get to get to the venue, I went to like a far place, I thought I, I read a promo for the place, um, nice venue, nice, oh my god, what a misleading, talk about misleading advertising, oh, it's big time misleading, <laughs> a huge bait and switch kind of scenario. Um, I should <laughs> See, I saw the projection on my knee. I saw that I didn't think reality. I denied the reality. I knew the reality. It'd be a bit like something like that. But no, I, I want to believe it's, it can be good. I want to believe it's uh, what it says kind of thing. So there's, that's the prototype. You know, we, we see what we, we need. We don't see the reality. We just see what, what we want to see kind of thing. We need to see based on our unmet needs. I was lighting it. Yeah, I'm still... Uh, yeah, I'm, not, I'm still trying to readjust myself. Oh, hold on a second. Uh, yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, I'm a little absent-minded today. Oh boy, should I just redo this video? What, what a rock! This has been a rough, st rough beginning. Uh, this is one of the roughest starts I've had to a video in a long time. Jeepers, yeah. What a pity. I need to be a little more flexible. I need to... I need to be a little more improv on my end to be flexible with things. Not to expect uh, some good condition I had previously to always be like that. I gotta be like kind of... Uh, ben, uh, be like water, says Bruce Lee, you know, be, be like water, like the bamboo, like flow a little bit. Uh, well, hopefully I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get settled in finally and make up for this rocky beginning here. So uh, uh, a mother is emotionally immature if she's going to use her child to comfort her, to please her. And uh, she enjoys the oneness that's created because she didn't fully get it with her mother. So she parentifies the baby, expects the baby to be a symbiotic object for her, a self-object for her. You know, uh, we, we did that quote from the famous poem, Anne, Anne 1960, uh, a famous poet by the name of Anne Sa Saxton or Sexton or something. I forgot. The last line of that poem it said, um, the mother said to the daughter, I made you to find me. I made you because I want to find me. 
I made you to be a parent so I can find me. I'm going to use you to help me find myself. I made you to find me. That was her actual line. And she apologized. The poem was an apology to her adult daughter. I'm assuming she was in her 60s or 70s and she was writing to her adult child in her 40s or something, apologizing. I'm sorry. I, I, I just, I used you because I needed some kind of support because I was trying to find myself. I didn't see you. I didn't care about you. I didn't attend to your needs. I only saw my needs. I only saw um, how I didn't get my needs met. And I used you to play somebody to satisfy my unmet needs. And that was my attempt to find myself. Sorry. A very good poem. Check it out. About, about maybe two. I think it's in uh, today's six, right? Five, not five. It's either in four or three. Check out those ones. 2802, three, or four. One of those ones. Uh, Anne Sexton, I think. Yeah, 1960. Now just, just yeah, search for that little poem. Just a short little easy poem, just like a, like four lines or five lines or something. Just a short little easy to read poem, not a complicated one, a simple one. But the concluding was great. The the the, grand, the, the older one said to the daughter. I try my, be my best not to get people in the camera, but once in a while it kind of happens a little bit. Plus I'm near the entrance and all this. Okay, a little, uh, it's okay. I'm, I'm feeling a bit of a general breeze all around, it's great, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, between the breeze and the fan, maybe I can hold out here. Let's see. Oh, another, another group coming in. Well, uh, give me, I don't want to get them in the camera, hold on a second. Let's, let's do this. Yeah, so emotionally immature parents. So if the mother is using the baby to take care, she's very emotionally immature. She's not being a mother for the child. Once again, the mother is going to be so blind to the child's needs because she only sees her unmet needs from the past, which she sees in the present because the present is still the past. In the emotional area, in the life force area, in the needs area, it's all in the play time of timelessness there's no time so whatever's going on in reality and present is still that emotional past so they don't see the reality of the present they're in survival anxiety they're in a survival anxiety they want mother's love and they're angry at her they're in that kind of struggle like this uh, so when, when a child is traumatized he ends up with a huge inner conflict any baby who uh, has to cope with an emotionally immature mother or later on father okay um, They're going to end up with this huge inner conflict. A, their needs weren't met. B, uh, to even identify their needs, it's going to bring up the pain of what happened the first time they tried to get their needs met. So there's a huge pain around, and no one wants to feel the pain, so they don't want to know their needs, let alone their, let alone their feelings. That's called alexithymia. But the needs are still there. The needs are still there. No person can be themselves without having had the experience of being loved by the mother to differentiate from her, to have a sense of self, and then you have your embodiment, the golden ball, and you love life by expressing your uniqueness at that place. So the psychic structure needed to love life and have feelings and enjoy and all this stuff okay, is what's called differentiation. But differentiation only takes place if the child feels safe with the mother. First, it's all meshed up. If he feels safe, he hatches out. His self identity can be established for him, and it kind of gets out of that egg, that prior egg like that. So the psychological egg is from the, from birth to four to five months. It's, and psychological, it's kind of like a meshed up egg. If you feel safe, things consolidate and he hatches out of the egg. And it's a gradual hatching up until the age of three. That's called, uh, they call that differentiation. Okay, so with the differentiation, that's your, your authentic self and your, your, your golden ball and all this. And, Then you love life by expressing what's unique about you because you can then recognize it and express it. That's called loving life, a path of heart, meaningful, and etc. The person becomes an elder, pleasure.
him. Um, Joy runs the Joy runs the console. But yes, there are losses. Joy can step aside. That sadness from the console because there's a floor. There's an identity. There's differentiation. There's, there's a stand. Okay. So that now the person's loving life. That's normal development where they love life. And Joy runs the console and can, and can easily, happily step aside to let sadness run the console to admit admit a loss. You see. So that's important. We need to admit losses because if you don't admit a loss, uh, that's going to lead to complicated grief, aggravated grief, the deal with the grief process, uh, pathological uh, nostalgia, melancholy, etc. And then there's what's called a snowballing effect or a kindling effect, where every new loss brings up all the old, un prior, unprocessed losses. So all the pain of the previous losses kind of build up a snowball like that. And each new event in the future, you're getting older, so littler, littler things can trigger as a kindling. So littler things are going to trigger more and more accumulated, unprocessed pain from the past. So snowballing and kindling, the person is going to end up as a bitter curmudgeon. Okay, those, those Grinches and Grouches, all those characters, uh, bitter and you know, um, you have to walk, you have to walk on eggshells around them. They're, they're so easily uh, uh, because um, they're trying to control everything. They're immensely micromanaging because they think that if they can control every little thing, then they won't experience any kind of little loss, like a micro loss. Because if they experience a micro loss, it'll bring up all the other losses. So they're very urgent to control every little thing. So if they don't get what their way, so to speak, um, then all they'll be enraged at um, the inability to feel. See, the rage is sadness is not available. The, the curmudgeon doesn't have a self-identity, so there's no sadness, they don't mourn. You go back to the primitive brain and rage is there. So anger is mainly a console. Anger is not a primary feeling. It's the reaction of when our needs don't get met. So the beauty of the Inside Out film, you know, I think with those two groups leaving, things have calmed down a bit, yeah. What's funny about that, eh? My, my nervous system kind of, I felt tense. Uh, I have anxiety, yeah, you're seeing it all the time. And I keep all my bloopers and mistakes in all the videos. So, yeah. Uh, how's, the, how's the wind effect? Oh, oh, hopefully you're not hearing that. How about now? What about just here? Would that work? Check the battery, hold on. 64, so it's almost halfway, right? Halfway, 40. So this will be like a an hour and a bit, yeah. So part two, I'm gonna change venues for part two. Um, if you want a good part one, the last one, the last one was a good part one. That six part video, 2805. That first one is 40 minutes long. I played it back myself. All right, Marcus. Yeah, that, you were on a roll. You were, you were, I was. I felt like I was a bit. I was a bit on a roll there. Uh, that was uh, not bad. I thought. This is the opposite. Uh, the, the, <laughs> this is the uh, clumsy, awkward, very awkward uh, uh, part one here. I'm spending all this time just trying to settle in, kind of. Thing. Emotionally immature parents. The psychic structure needed to be able to mourn losses. Okay. Um, the child has to have an identity. I feel there for am no amnes, no no sadness. Like I feel there for am. If you don't have your authentic amnes, you can't mourn the false self. You don't mourn with the false self. When we lose our authentic self, 
we develop a false self, a persona, uh, an adaptive self, whatever you want to call it, and we use that to go through life with. It's mostly a scaffold, it's like a bundle of defense mechanisms, scaffolding kind of thing, and uh, it, we use them to keep us away of the memory of the pain. So we're dependent on the false self to go through life to keep us away from the true self. But, as, but there's a gap like that. We're creating more and more of a gap as we do that, as we age. Finally, at midlife, okay, whoa, it's too much. You've gone too far. And now you're getting Freudian slips. Now you're getting psychosomatic symptoms. Now you're getting a nervous breakdown. Now you're getting, things, things are happening. Uh, you're, you're, you're irritable or something. You might even have the delayed onset of the developmental PTSD. So a person can have PTSD midlife and there's no situation that caused it. It's just the delayed onset of the PTSD that occurred, but it was scaffolded over with those defense mechanisms. Bergler calls it like a sponge, it kind of sponges it up, so to speak. But it dries out, he says, at midlife. And then at midlife, people say, why am I so irritable? Why am I easily distracted or something? Why am I, why, why, uh, why am I not you know, mourning or why am I not feeling pleasure? Something's missing here. And so now the person looks at the checklist for PTSD and they go, oh my God, I got all these symptoms here, PTSD. Where'd this come from? I don't, I don't have PTSD. I, I wasn't in any uh, serious uh, thing. Uh, you know, there was no shock thing. But he's got all the symptoms of it. What well, does that make sense? He doesn't remember any situational thing. Well, it's a relational trauma, developmental trauma. It's still a trauma. But with relational trauma, he, the defense mechanisms mask it. That mask wears out at midlife. So, and then if that's the case, uh, then, then you not, now you know you had developmental trauma. And the symptoms were just delayed in its appearance. It's called delayed onset. Um, usually, it's, usually it's like a, a, a hunch, like someone says, Jack, something's off here. I feel like I'm missing something. something. I don't know what it is, but something's off here. Well, you're not in touch with your inner home. You're not in touch. Snow White is still sleeping in the box. You're not in touch with okay, the statue. Echo is still a statue. You're not in touch with your authentic self. Uh, we all live in a psychic house called the Soul Castle in the Odyssey of Ithaca. We're not in touch with our inner Ithaca, our inner embodiment. Kristen Wilson says, yeah, if you're not in your body, you're not making sense, literally, and it's disembodied, just like sense of self and logical sense, literally. You're not making sense if, you, if you're not in your body. And it's disembodied discourse that causes all these confusions and problems. Because with disembodied discourse, people are grasping. They're still looking for mother's love. They, they have what's called the, the un conscious hope for the fulfillment of old unfulfilled needs and they want to make themselves unaware of it in the process and they want to show the world how the mother treated them by treating others the way the mother treated them and seeing the one they just hurt as the mother who hurt them now they're fighting with the one they just hurt in their constant struggle to change the mother control the mother to get the mother to cooperate and be a loving mother we're not making sense like this Um, yeah, hopefully the audio is okay. I, uh, I'm still trying to calm, calm myself. Look at that, eh? It's taken me almost an hour to settle in here. Jesus Christ. I don't know why I'm a little antsier today. I don't know what it is. Something about today made me a little antsier for some reason. I can't explain it. Like I, Maybe I did have some kind of dream and I didn't pay attention to it. Maybe I brushed it off, like maybe I, you know, sometimes I do, like I don't always r record my dreams. Like when you wake up, you're meant to like pause for a minute. Don't jump up like, whoa, what, what did you dream? Make a note of it. TTAQ, give the dream a title, identify the theme, after A for after Q for question. Meaning see if you can formulate some kind of question. You think your unconscious self, your repressed self, your secret self, your snow white self, okay? Your, your unknown self, your secrets, your double self, okay? All of you that you don't know about. If that were a character, what, what would that, what question might this character be asking you? It's a question from you to you. It's a question from your true you to your conscious, what, what you have of, you, of your conscious you. Okay, it's your unconscious self trying to ask you something, trying to make the unconscious conscious. So you, you, you wake up in the morning, you have a dream. That's like a message from the unconscious to the conscious. So the, the image is Hermes flies across. Hermes flies across with a message. In the Odyssey, okay, um, the id means all the energy life force bound up in the past and it's pretty powerful like that all the child's energy and life force is uh no, hold on a second oh he's a staff guy okay um 
all, all that energy uh, um, is bound up in that cycle uh, uh, of the memory of the loop between the baby and the mother. All the energy is in there. All the, and it's pretty powerful, like the iceberg. So life force, all of the life, child's life force is devoted or invested or confected or bound to this old struggle with the mother. Come on, mother, I need your love. Mother said no. I need your love. Mother said no. All the energy is in that kind of thing. So uh, this is repressed. It's amnesic memory, but it's, un it's the known, unknown, unknown, known. Okay, trying, trying to make us consciously known. We're trying to make a known, make the unconscious conscious. Where it was, ego shall be. Where it was, ego shall be. We need a consciousness of what we previously didn't know about ourselves and make that previously unknownness about ourselves, make that conscious. That's making the unconscious conscious. And the more you can make yourself conscious, the more you're connected to yourself. And that's healing, healing and wholeness. The more you get back yourself, the more your whole hence healed, healing and wholeness, title of John A. Sanford's book. Once again, when I say John A. Sanford, I mean the guy who wrote the book, Healing and Wholeness, that John A. Sanford. Or he also wrote Invisible Partners, the psychology guy. He puts uh, religious stories on the couch, actually. He takes religious stories and looks for the psychological message of them. Not many people do this, so he did a brilliant thing. Uh, I'm still hoping somebody will post his cassette tapes that he, did, that he gave. He did the lecture circuit in the 90s or 80s or whatever, and, um, and he created a cassette tape company called Journey Into Wholeness. And he went around uh, giving these lectures, giving psychological interpretations of religious stories. He says, for example, forget about the superficial. Look for the psychological message. They're metaphors of psychology. He treats them sort of in the same spirit as, as, as interpreting myths and fairy tales, that they're products of the unconscious, that they're primary process mentations. So he emphasizes this point uh, that, uh, that you, the value of religious stories is um, they're code for psychology. So just like Miss and are code for psychology. So look for the psychology of it. Uh, so in the, in the Odyssey, the myth, the Odyssey, that energy okay, called the it was personified into a character called Poseidon in the ocean, powerful ocean. And there was a wave there speaking to Odysseus. Now that's not a separate character, that's not an outer dialogue. Odysseus and the wave, that's not separate. It's a metaphor that our unconscious is trying to communicate to us. In the beginning, Odysseus was the typical narcissistic, arrogant, I don't need you, I don't care about you. Oh no, I, I'm, I'm, the, I'm your energy bound in the past. It's painful like this and you're ignoring me, I don't like this. Well, what do you want me to do here? Okay, then, then, he, then first step was he had to identify the situation. So he uh, learned that his mother betrayed him and that's why he betrays himself and he does it like Sisyphus. So he went to Underworld, saw his mother there, saw Agamemnon there, yeah, how he betrays himself, the ways his mother betrayed him. I was looping around because when Odysseus looked, looked into Sisyphus' face, he saw that it was his face. That sort of began the whole thing. He says, oh my God, I get it. I get what you, thank you Odysseus, thank you for this hunch. Okay, so at midlife we get this hunch that, that we're not connected to ourselves. Then we go on this journey. This journey is called the second journey in midlife. For the second half of life, it's called the second journey. For the second half of life, post 40, ballpark. Um, Joseph Campbell famously calls it the hero's journey. Okay, we want to get back our authentic self. He describes it as not feeling fully alive and real. So we want to feel fully alive and real. That's the midlife hero's journey to get back our inner home. So Ithaca is a metaphor for the soul castle, psychic house, and then you want to find the home. And on the way, we see the story, all these temptations, all those female voices, oh, give up, don't bother, forget it, don't try it, stay like a little child, stay like a playboy, oh, just blank out, oh, just forget about it, just be selfish, just be a child, just uh, go to Lotus Land, eat ice cream or whatever. All these temptations um, to stay regressed. Those were the voices of the mother saying, look, child, those are the memory of the mother saying to him as a child, child, you don't need to go anywhere, you don't need anything, I, I'm everything for you. Just turn to me, stay with me, because that mother wants to use the child uh, so that the mother doesn't feel alone, that somebody listens to her, somebody respects her, somebody's there for her. She feels youthful in a blissful kind of place. So she's doing it, she's doing that kind of thing. So she's the one who says to the child, are you with me or against me? That's where that comes from. That's a powerful thing to say to a baby. When a mother says that, child, you're gonna be independent, I withdraw, I, 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 don't, I ignore you, I'll abandon you. Please mother, no, fine, I'll do what you want. I'll sacrifice my autonomy, I'll, I'll 
give up, I'll freeze up my soul. I'll let Snow White stay sleeping in the snow box and uh, ice box, or uh, glass box, and I'll do what you want. I'll be all good. And then she rewards that. She, the jargon is she rewards regression, she rewards symbiosis, and punishes the child's autonomy. So the voice of that, the memory of that, those are represented by those various female characters on that journey. Okay, Calypso. Okay, I'll stay childlike. Just eat ice cream. Um, let me mother you, kind of thing. Just stay, stay childlike. The other one, oh, you can be a playboy. And Cersei, oh, you can be a playboy. Who cares? Uh, because playboys, um, they're married to mom, you see, and um, they're loyal to mom because um, the trick is no woman can uh, be a better version of the missing good mom that they needed, so it never works. So the trick is, oh, you can be a playboy. That's very emotionally immature, of course, because um, sexuality, uh, Karen Horney says, it's meant to like uh, be uh, an expression, like a bodily expression of your love and all that. He doesn't have that love. So if he, one defense against uh, tenderness and all that is the sexualization process, uh, you see, and you're not connecting your feelings with the body and all this. It's kind of split like, fam the famous split like that. So one of the characters say, oh yeah, maintain that split. You don't have to heal yourself. You don't have to feel whole. You don't have to go back to your home. But this is just, no, I, wanna, I want my feelings. And I want my physical to come from my feelings. That's called the yin and the yang of healing. Okay, uh, inside out, you want your feelings of the tenderness on the inside, the love on the inside. If you have love on the inside, your outside intimacy will be reflect that. So the romance area is an expression of the love within. If you don't feel the love within, the romance area um, can be used as a defense against that, to split it like that. Karen Horn and I talks a fair bit about uh, this. Uh, she calls it neurotic love. It's not really love, actually. But um, uh, in the next video, we have a quote from Karen Horn and I about this. Uh, that was just sort of a partial preview of it. Um, yeah, we don't really have too much on that topic, to tell you the truth. We've got 60 topics on the go as it is. Maybe in the future, we'll, we'll pick up on that topic. That's a huge topic. Uh, there's 10,000 quotes right there, just that whole area, you know. Um, the gap between the, the love and sex, you know, like you, it's meant to be together, like the tenderness, um, the feelings of uh, accepting somebody and the emotional connection and your love for that and your care and your physicality comes from that feeling. So it's inside out. You want the inside out. If you try to do something on the outside in, it never works. Nothing on the outside can fill that um, sense of self that's missing. Back to Anne Sexton, right? Uh, she said to the daughter, I created you because I was looking for me. So she wanted to find her identity outside in. Made a baby, brainwashed a baby that's outside, looked to the child to be a mother so she could find her inside. That was outside in. Never works. Outside in doesn't work. You got to heal the inside and come from inside out. That's another way of using that phrase, inside out. Okay? Like if, you're, if you have your feelings, your doing is normal. If you have your feelings, you know what to do. It's natural, it's normal, and it's, it's clear to you. Because it's with heart, it's love, it's pleasurable, it's, it's, it's clear, it's, it feels good, uh, it's not at anybody's expense, it's integrity, it's wholeness. It's, um, so you're doing, it's kind of clear like that when you have your feelings. I feel therefore I am. If you have your amnes, uh, then your doing is normal. If, you, if your woodman phrases it as, well, the yin and the snow white, we can call that the wounded feminine element or the wounded feminine principle, the feelings and the beingness, right? So snow white means our beingness and authentic beingness and all that. If that's wounded like that, then our doing is distorted. She says the distorted masculine comes from the wounded feminine. The wounded feminine leads to the, to, to the distorted masculine. So first heal the, in, heal the man in the mirror, heal the inner. You know, look, uh, Michael Jackson's song, Man in the Mirror. Uh, ballpark, ballpark idea. In other words, you gotta grieve. The, you gotta grieve. Get your mother's story. The, the truth will upset you free. Admit the painful truth that she failed you. Right? I mean, uh, she, the, uh, there's a quote, a quote says, the greatest hurt of all, mother failed me, unquote. So you gotta get to that kind of place. Admit the painful truth that she was wounded herself, she was emotionally immature herself. That's why she failed. She only saw her past. It's a compulsion. When people only see their past, it has a compulsion quality to it because how the child's life force is to find the mother. It's like a compulsion. It's like an urgency. It's like the Fairbairn's famous line is, life force is object seeking. 
all, when the baby comes out of the uterus, all of his energy, all of his drive and all this, all of his instinct, or whatever you want to call it, it, it's to find mother, latch on, and create the blissful oneness. He does. He has no other thought in his mind, no other thing he wants to do. All he wants to do, all of his energy is to find the mother. The mother's everything for him. He, so you think about all these songs, you're my everything, you're my first, you're my last, you're my everything, oh, you're the one, you're my everything. Think about these kind of songs. That, that reflects uh, this area. The, 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 the problem in this area. Those songs make rep or code for that area, problems in that area, where, where it was unmet and you're looking for it. And you're... Oops, oh!